This is Tom McCullough, and I would like to welcome you to the Wealth of Wisdom podcast. In this Wealth of Wisdom podcast series, we are uh, we have the pleasure of interviewing and having conversations with our contributing authors to Wealth of Wisdom, the top practices for wealthy families and their advisors. And um, we're really excited about the series, and I'm really excited today to have Jay Hughes uh, with me. And Jay is a retired attorney author, long-term advisor to families, and widely considered uh, as the father of the field of family wealth. So, Jay, welcome and uh, glad to have you here today. Um, it's a great pleasure and my congratulations to you and Keith on bringing this project uh, to a very, very good beginning, not an end. The publication right. is a beginning, it's not an end. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Yeah. And um, so... Uh, Actually, my first question was going to be, um, and I think maybe Keith wrote this in your biography, not even you, but widely considered to be the father of the field of family wealth. What what does that sound like to you? Uh, well, I'm about to be 80. It feels very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I seriously doubt its uh, accuracy. Uh, people have said this. Um, Tom, being very short, because we want to keep on time, I would say this. Um, I'm one of the very, very few people left uh, in the legal field um, who came into the profession in the late 1960s. That is relevant to that point because the men who trained me had come into the field in the mid-1930s. Mm. And in turn, those men had come, were trained by men who had come into the field around 1900. Hmm. I am the history of the, those periods. And 1900, more or less, was the flowering of the results of the post-Civil War boom hmm. in England, uh, the uh, ending and the, uh, sort of the great territorial and in Canada as well. <clears throat> so I wouldn't say I am the founder what I would say is I am the connecting point hmm. between the extraordinary creativity at 1900 where the problems were all new hmm. and how men and most a few, few women, mostly men, brought solutions forward. And I feel that I'm the holder, not of those solutions, but of the thinking that lay behind those solutions. Hmm. And it's been my privilege, in a sense, in my life to be in that very odd time warp. Um, and a lot of things happened in the 1970s that aren't germane today that caused, frankly, a lot of those ideas to be lost. Hmm. And so I've really felt that my task was a little bit what Erasmus did. How do you go back and find the texts? Hmm. And how do you find them and bring them forward. So I don't feel that I'm the founder of anything. What I feel is that I am the continuation of people who have thought about the question of family flourishing for a very long time. Hmm. Interesting. Can, can you, uh, for those people who don't know your background, how did a mild-mannered uh, attorney end up shifting to thinking about family flourishing as opposed to documents? Uh, alone. Just to tell us a bit about that story and, and what was the motivation for you to, you know, make this shift in your life in some ways? Uh, Tom, I'm out on this, and so I'm very comfortable discussing it. I had a huge midlife crisis um, right on time at the age of 49. As Dante mm -hmm. said, in midlife, I found myself in a dark wood with no way out. Now, some of that was personal. Uh, and some of it was professional. So it's, we're in a professional conversation today. I'll uh, stay on that side. What happened was that I began to realize about a year before that crisis, of course, it takes a while, something was bothering me. And it was, and it just kept getting more and more in my psyche. Until one day, and it was a tough day, I realized that I had made a moral mistake as an attorney. Hmm. 
not a legal mistake, a moral mistake. The moral mistake was that I had become so talented and so expert in very, very complex systems, structuring and governance systems. And I had forgotten, and that's a terrible thing, but I, I'm perfectly capable of saying it, that the families could not make work what I was creating. Essentially, what I did, and the people like me around the world, the British lawyers and the French lawyers and the Swiss and the American lawyers had dominated uh, that field around the world, um, was to discover really, really complex structures to deal with taxes and creditors and political issues and things, only to discover that I was the only person that could make them work. That's a moral failing in a profession. Mm -hmm. They, so that drove me into the dark wood. And I sat there for a year, as best I could, um, dealing with the really heavy moral and spiritual consequences of instead of creating greater freedom in the families I was serving, I was actually reducing their freedom. Not intentionally. No, of course not. Now, and, and creating a burden, as you've talked about in the past. Absolutely. So... Then I had to decide uh, in that dark wood, should I stay with what I was doing? I couldn't do it the way I was doing it. That was impossible, morally unacceptable. So as I was sitting there and began to think about it, I thought, well, I wonder whether there's a way to do this that would be entirely humane rather than scientific. <clears throat> yes, there would still be some science, but could, and so two questions then emerged over the, the next 25 years of my life. The first was that no system should ever be made available to clients that they can't make work themselves. I, I can tell you with great sadness that that is not the case today. That's a moral failing of the professions. It's a moral failing of the shall I say, the expert path for uh, economics, and I'm a good capitalist, I'm happy people make good living, but it is morally wrong. Second thing is that wealth itself means well-being. It doesn't mean money. I learned that a long time ago, and, and I've been practicing that. So what I really would say is, for me, the awakening... <clears throat> to can the family make it work themselves and the awakening that wealth is well-being, not financial capital, uh, have helped me greatly in the second half of my life. Mm. And I know from uh, many, many people that you have even though some things haven't changed, you've had have very significant influence on a lot of people. And uh, we just interviewed um, uh, John A. Warnick uh, mm -hmm. the other day, and he, he talked a little bit about, or a lot about, how your thinking, you know, um, has permeated the the industry. And maybe that's where the you know the father of the uh, the family wealth field comes from, because of the you've had play. Maybe you've played a father type role in in uh, passing on some of those values and skills. Tom, um, I think that that word is. Okay, I accept it. I would say that more being a regent. Hmm. The great work of serving professionals is always some form of regency. Hmm. Always. The client is too old, too young, away, doesn't have right. the knowledge. We, right. we sit asking, can I, if you would like my help, then can I help you be more free by virtue of that? And that's the regions. Yeah. So you're ready to do it yourself. Yeah, interesting. So interesting. father is okay, but <laughs> I hear you. I think maybe regent is more. I uh, hear you. Humane. I hear you. So you were um, you were our first choice to write the foreword to this book. Uh, we thought it was um, fitting and uh, appropriate. And I must say that I was very touched by your foreword. It had nothing 
the forward has nothing to for those who have not read it, it has nothing to do with um, um, me or Keith or anything. It is about the reader, and um, I'm going to ask Jay to talk a little bit about his concept of entering the room. But the idea of thinking about the people who are going to be reading this book, like you would think about the people who you'd be speaking to if you went into a room, and helping them maybe even prepare themselves to receive some of the this wealth of wisdom that's in the book. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about um, this practice of, of entering the room. And, and, and interestingly enough, this is a book about practices. So what Jay did in his foreword is he basically took a practice that he's used himself and used that to kind of set, set up the book. So can I ask you to tell us a bit about that entering the room practice? Uh, Tom, yes, thank you. Um, again, in the second half of my professional career, because I did not know this the first half, it's an earlier conversation today, I was one day standing outside of a room. We had lots of materials. We were going to be together for a couple of days. Uh, you can imagine the enthusiasm. There's lots of people, family have gathered, and there's a big agenda and lots and lots of stuff. And I'm about to enter the room, just the way I entered rooms for years, and something stopped me. Now, I, I do think that there are spirits alive in the world who, from time to time, say, hey, pay attention. If you're, if you're awake, not awake, okay, you will get the message. But, and I thought, you know, I think there's something I need to do before I go in this room to honor these people. After all, they're privileging me by the opportunity to be of service. That's my reason in this lifetime. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to sit down here in a quiet place. I'll be a little late, but uh, I'll, I think I'll sit down here. And what came into my consciousness was a practice, as you said, which I have now used universally ever since, including before I make a talk or anything I do, I take four or five minutes, make sure it's a quiet place. And I ask myself, bring into your consciousness each of the people that's going to be in that room. Bring them into your consciousness, just for a minute. See them, appreciate them. And ask yourself, Jay, Tom, what stage of life is this person in? What are likely to be the questions that he or she would bring if we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Now, that practice gives me, and I hope the people I'm going to see, an awareness of where they're likely to be coming to the meeting from, regardless of the agenda, regardless of the political and emotional issues. No, who are, who are they likely to be? Not are likely to be, not typecasting. And then when I finish that, I then bring the whole group into my consciousness. And I ask, what stage of life is this community? In? Is this stage, of, is this community uh, a community that's been fixed in its membership, let's say for 25 years, for a whole generation, and actually doesn't know that the next 10 years it's gonna have a lot of new members? Oh, well, maybe I should talk to them about that. Or are some of the people aging? And are we unable to acknowledge we're going to lose them? Um, because the mind tends to look to the youngest. Well, that's a natural good thing in family because you want long flourishing. But wait a minute. What are the questions of the seniors? Not just because I'm a senior. But what are their questions? Well, if you look at the whole family system, as a combination of those of those questions and the family itself as an organic living unit, it's amazing when you walk into the room the difference of how you enter that space. Hmm. Now you said that it um, it all that approach gives you sort of a beginner's mind. What yes. what do you what do you mean by that? Well, think for a second. Uh, all of our wonderful watchers, how many rooms in your professional life you enter 
with an intention, with an agenda, and subjects that you are absolutely essential in your mind to getting done. Where are the human beings in that question? <laughs> How many meetings of family offices, trust companies, uh, whatever the nature is, do we enter where the experts have an agenda to accomplish that the human beings may have no connection to at all. Right. See, that's the problem I had in the first half of my life. Yeah. Is those agendas were critical. <clears throat> that was why I was hired. They were critical to being achieved. Yeah. Now, but not necessarily that day or that month in 150 or 200 year to the fifth generation arriving and flourishing. Yeah. Maybe not quite but maybe there's something else going on in the human experience and the evolving experience of that human system that maybe is way more important. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. I uh, said at the beginning of this part of the conversation that it, it this forward really touched me. I really felt that it was um, um, a good idea. I thought it was honoring to the people who you would be speaking to so i have begun to practice it myself oh i'm so and, happy and this is the idea of this book is that all of us can learn i always think you know nobody has the best idea or the right idea or the single idea you know so even so one of the benefits already to me of this book is i have learned to practice and guess what i practiced it today in preparation for this meeting with you oh thank you thank and you. i thought about you and i thought about where are you at? Do you, you know, I know you've been trying to retire for a long time, but people keep asking you to do things. I thought about <laughs> your age and stage and your thoughts about being in and, you know, a role as an elder or a regent perhaps. Yes. And, and I thought about, um, you know, you know, you, I don't know, all sorts of things, living, living in Aspen. And so my, my mind was full of you and thinking about what you might have for us and what you might need for yourself. So very, That's, very good practice, I found. found. Um, thank you. My heart is awake and appreciative. Namaste. Thank you so much. That's really kind. I have learned. I have learned and will continue to learn. So um, in, in addition to writing the foreword, uh, we asked Jay to um, be one of our contributing authors and contribute a practice uh, that he has used with families and so and then we asked him to do the forward so and even that was a practice and then he said well I have two and we said absolutely let's do two <laughs> so I'm gonna ask Jay to talk about two uh, of the practices that are in the book the, the first one is um, chapter 20 which is called creating a family bank and that'll be the first one we talk about. And uh, it's interesting. And I'd, be, we'll be, I'd like to hear um, your thoughts on the practice and how you've used it and some examples. But I'm also interested in why you chose that one. You must have hundreds of practices that you've used or come across over your years. And so, you know, wh why did this one, for example, come to mind as an important one? Why is it important for families? Um, Tom, there are two ways into this. Um, one of your, well, not one, your co-author, Keith Whitaker, and uh, his partner, Susan Masenzio, and I together wrote a book called uh, The Cycle of the Gift. We are fascinated, the three of us, by the difference between gifts and transfers. Now, that's not the, the subject here, although it was, it is in the book, and it's the subject of your earlier book. I'm fascinated by the outcome of true gifts, which uh, Aristotle said must be magnanim must be magnificent, therefore you must have the quality of magnanimity, yeah. as opposed to transfers which are very dangerous. <clears throat> that distinction is huge. To live in a gift is an entirely different experience than to live in a transfer. Gifts are pure. Here, I give you a gift. Transfers always have obligations and goals associated with them, good or bad. This area for families is enormously important because 
if they have financial capital, looking well in my finger, everybody's, I'm sure, all. No, maybe not. J j just do a parenthetical. Okay. Uh, so five spiritual capital, social capital, intellectual and human. Qualitative capital is the critical capital of a family, Tom. The financial capital, quantitative, has only one purpose, support growing these. Is that Nothing why it's else. pointing down? Yeah, see, it's a foundation. <laughs> uh, foundation. Now, oh, by, okay. by the way, if it's pointing up, the other ones disappear. Oh, there you go. Very good. And then shirt sleeve wins every time. Mother Nature says, do this. I'm happy. I, I don't have to worry. You're done. <laughs> do that she says oh, how did you figure that out interesting oh my goodness you're growing your spiritual social intellectual and human selves supported by the oh she said that's really smart you might last a long time <laughs> <laughs> okay so transfers and gifts are going to occur all the time in these systems so paying attention to what's a gift and what's a transfer is huge as to outcome attention to that question what am i doing here it isn't saying transfers are bad and gifts are always good it's simply saying can you pay attention to the difference Do you know what you're doing okay can you imagine the consequences okay so imagine for a moment uh, my father was a victorian man uh born in uh, 1913 but he was victorian and I'm invited into his study. Literally, that's how he operated. And so one day he invited me into his study and he said, Jay, I want to talk to you about something and I want you then to communicate to your brother and sisters. Well, I was the eldest child and that was that was the way it worked. And I was a lawyer, he was a lawyer, so it was that way it worked. And so he said, I have something very simple to tell you. And I knew then I was in trouble. I was going to be there for a long time. <laughs> And he said, your mother and I are now a bank. What? I said, Dad, you're a lawyer. He said, no, no, it's very simple. Your mother and I are now a bank. I said, Dad, I, what, what are you talking about? He said, Jay, you recall that your mother and I had a goal, which we shared with you and your brother and sisters, to get you all through private education through college. So we lots of things we might have done with he was making a very good living as a senior lawyer in New York and a very important firm that he was in the management of. Um, but he said that was our goal. He said, you recall a few weeks ago, your youngest sister graduated from college. I'm like, oh, that's right. He said, so we've completed that. He said, your mother and I now have financial resources, not a lot, but enough to take care of us as old people. So you won't. We won't be dependent on you. And we have a little more. And he said, that is now bank money. Said, Still, what are you talking about? He said, well, we're now looking at the four of you and your spouses and the two of us as a family bank. And he said, what we would like to do, and by the way, I've never heard anybody on the planet ever suggest this before. This is my father's gift to the book, to our viewers today. I hope it's a profound gift. It's a gift. He said, we would like you and your brother and sisters to create a family bank, uh, not any forms, not any corporation, and the bank window be open to grants and loans that you four would decide if there was something one of you needed. Now, while mom and I will have a veto, we'll never exercise it. We have complete confidence in you. What we would like to know is from time to time what you did. So, Tom, from that point forward, my brother and my younger sisters and I, from time to time, would gather when one of us had uh, a request, and we would gather intentionally, positively toward that request. And we would be a kind of Greek chorus for it, so that one of us would ask, and the others would ask questions. Mm. And when that was formed, and it was a grant or a loan, and, and when we did both, we would then go to my parents and say, well, this is what's happened. And um, would this be okay? And mom and dad would say, yes. I cannot strongly enough advise families how incredibly powerful my father's vision was. <laughs> because it wasn't about transfers. It was about gifts. It was magnanimous. 
How do you advance something? How do you enhance human experience was his goal. It's it's an incredibly important spiritual reality of what he was doing. Now, there are some family banks that are being created as venture capital. I'll just touch this this way, and then probably we've covered it. As venture capital vehicles for families, this is absolutely not that. This is not an investment company or designed around growing financial capital. This is designed to grow these to get the siblings to know each other, to know the nephews and nieces and, and their children, and expose them to a family's resources toward growing these. And there, I think my father was not only way ahead of his time, he was incredibly connected to very high ideals, which he practiced. He didn't just talk about them, he practiced them. And I, I'm not saying he was some paragon, no. He was a man, he was a, my father, a great lawyer, the greatest I ever knew. This idea grew from his classical education of the Greeks and the Romans. Hmm. He, he could see how a family could <clears throat> narrow its focus to the money and die. Hmm or how it could expand its focus by humanely looking at the qualitative questions of its members and seeking to enhance those qualities. Family banks are really, really valuable. Do you have um, tips or thoughts for families who say, sounds like a good idea. Are there things to be careful of, things to be certain not to miss out on to make make it and it, i'm sure it depends on each family as well but are there some general thoughts you have somebody is serious about looking into this well i'll just touch one there are many but i think in the time we have i'll touch one one of the great questions in families is whether a family member joining my eldest granddaughter is getting married in september so we have a new family member and in my little branch of the family, this is the first new member. And since my daughter was, well, granddaughter's wife, but first new member. Hmm. Lots of go talk, Tom, goes on in our field about outlaws and how risky it is. And, okay, people who marry into a family are the only ones who choose us. <laughs> right. Goodness. Hmm. Um, <laughs> So the question for us is, are we positively attracting? You know, we, we can't be without people joining us. <clears throat> that's, that's our future. So if a family has a family bank, as, and it's a highly conscious family, not a perfect, they're no perfect, they're just conscious, awake. And there's about to be a person joining a family well, the family bank spends a little time on the question of, is there some grant here that we should make to acknowledge this? Might we welcome this person? Well, that's a great conversation for a family bank because we're about to get a new asset and what we don't want is a new liability. Right. We have enough liabilities with ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you remember the old saying, you know, people who live in glass houses. <laughs> yes. Yeah, true. True, true. Or the, or the, or the might in your eye and the four by yes. four in mine. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some pretty good stuff around yeah. about how we are. So if we're making welcoming someone who we want to be, an asset of our journey, then that's a kind of conversation. Now, people would say, well, wait a minute. That's not a grant or loan to you or your brother and sisters. Aha, uh -huh, of course it is. Because if we can strengthen the marriage that's about to happen, oh my goodness, what have we done? We've grown our spiritual and social selves. So that's that's an odd answer, but it's I think it's a more uh, uh, sort of a deeper one than I've I could have given you about, well, somebody needs some help for his child's education. Or again, I'm not minimizing these. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. there's a, a particular health issue 
that emerges where there's an opportunity for a better outcome than could be achieved in the norm. So, I mean, these are, I'm not saying these are any, ob nothing's obvious. Yeah. Because you don't know what the person's going to come and ask about. But I do think this question of, of being welcoming and, by the way, immediately having that new spouse join the family bank board. Hmm. Immediately. I was struck by not only the benefits to the family communally of something like this, but you also talked about a lot of the skills that are required in terms of presenting an idea um, are, are the kinds of skills that, you know, we all need, especially young people as they develop in, in their own lives. Well, and I would also say this in <laughs> WASP families like mine, asking was something you did not do ah, interesting <laughs> that was yeah. not acceptable so yeah. you couldn't be more right that again depending on the cultural uh or orientation of a family learning to ask how is that important and trusting the people who are listening to seek to enhance the outcome of the conversation those two things are hugely important yeah yeah very very good we could spend much more time on this topic and drill down into it we don't have the time but no. uh, there, there is some um there are some books listed at the end of each of the chapters yes. in the uh the book that yes <clears throat> if people are interested in more information or ideas uh certainly um they can go there uh, let's let's move to the uh, second chapter that you contributed it's a little bit of a subversive one in a good way and it's called <laughs> yes, it uh, is. Facilitating Grandchild Grandparent Philanthropy. And I'll just quote your the, the, the first quote that's in your book. Um, you said, to introduce this practice, I think it's useful to reinterpret the Chinese proverb, quote, grandparents and grandchildren are the natural enemies of the parents. And you reinterpret it as grandparents and grandchildren are natural allies. So, uh, but then you tie that with philanthropy. So tell us about this practice and why you chose it, and how it, you think it works well in families. Well, everything good depends upon understanding each other's dreams. Uh, families are dreams. Uh, they are the product of two people who have a dream. Um, and that dream either uh, creates affinity or it doesn't. It creates affinity, then there's a possibility of positive connection generation after generation. What I realized, Tom, many, many years ago, and again, we use this in my family, and I use it with many of the families that I've helped, this particular practice, is grandparents want to be able to tell their stories to their grandchildren. And grandchildren want to hear those stories. Grandparents are also able, far more objectively than parents, to hear someone's dream and not immediately find holes in it, but rather just to live in the dream. It's hard for parents because we have goals and objectives. Can we really be objective about our children? No. Are we likely to be subjective about them? Yes. Grandparents, not so much. So grandparents can listen. We have the age and stage of life, coming back to an earlier conversation, where listening is a virtue. And what do we want to hear more than anything else on the planet, our grandchildren's dreams? Because not only do we want to hear them, we love them, but that's our future. We won't be here, but that's a future. Oh my gosh, that's fascinating. And we'd like them to know something about where they came from. Would they like to know something about their great-grandparents if they didn't meet them? Or even their great-great-grandparents, who we knew were our grandparents. So there's a natural connection in the oral uh, history side of storytelling between children telling grandparents dreams and grandparents telling grandchildren stories. There's a, a natural uh, connection there. So what I saw was 
Okay. Would, does that happen naturally? Yes. Does it happen in community? No. So I took the natural oral history <clears throat> goals and aspirations of the two generations, and I thought, suppose we added philanthropy. Again, grandparents, very interested in it. So the idea was, okay, let's ask the grandchildren to come to a meeting with the grandparents, six years and older. Let's ask them, the grandchildren, deal that they must come and ask for something for someone else. And they must tell us why this is important to them, dreams emerging. They must go to that organization beforehand and find out a little bit about it, and then come and make a presentation and ask what's well, hard in families. You learn to ask in a family at six, you're never going to have any problem asking at 60. Not in a bad ask, a positive ask. Who am I? What, what will enhance my life? And each of the grandchildren takes a turn. And maybe the six-year-old has three sentences, and maybe the 15 or 16-year-old has a page. And then we vote. Of course, we vote for it. And age-specific amounts, age-appropriate, not specific amounts, arise from the grandparents to the grandchildren. Right that day, here's a check. With the understanding that the grandchild must go back to that philanthropy and deliver the check. All right, Tom. Oh, dear. I'm sorry about this. I can't get rid of it. I'm sorry. No um, I apologize. Um, no I forgot. Apologies. I forgot to turn it off. Um, here, let me see if I can. I can't. I can barely hear it. It's fine. Okay. I don't know how to get rid of it. So uh, just keep, anyway. keep rolling. Don't worry about it. Okay. So um, it'll go away. Um, so now the grandparents' turn comes. And the grandparents in that gathering tell stories. Sometimes there are stories that grow out of those grandchild's dreams that converge in other dreams. Sometimes they're their own dreams. <clears throat> At the end of the day, and it's usually two or three hours, the grandparents have had one of the great events of their lives. And the grandchildren don't really know why this was such a special day. <laughs> but they know something very unusual happened. Now, what's also in this that isn't so obvious? Well, if we look at dynastic families, and often, I don't mean that in a bad way, but looking at the families that we tend to help in our practices, they either have an intention to be dynastic, not kings and queens, no, that they have intention to have a future, or we're working already with the second or third or fourth generation of one of these families, and they are already essentially dynastic. What isn't seen, Tom, in this practice is that the grandchildren find out who each other is. Hmm. Not only. It's not formal, but they're listening. And the older ones can begin a little bit of leadership of a, of a cohort, of an age cohort. And by the way, that cohort, as Strain, uh, Strauss and Howe taught us, uh, with the millennials or the iGen or whatever term you like, tend to have commonality in certain cultural aspects. Well, discovering between the 15-year-old and the three or six-year-old what those commonalities are forms bonds way into the future. But you don't say so. Remember, subtlety is really needed. You just yeah. don't tell everything, as my dad would say. You just offer enough so that people can think, well, that's an interesting, let me try it. Let me try it, yeah. So grandparent, grandchild, now, as you said at the very beginning, the parents are not welcome. Yes, I was going to ask, how do the parents uh, fit the into parents, this, or do they not? <laughs> well, um, this is where there's the law of unexpected consequences, uh, <clears throat> which is what I always end this practice by reminding an audience. I just thought when I thought this up, and I, I'm sure others have thought it up too, but when I thought it up and began to use it, that it was purely good. That it would always be fine. Uh-uh. <laughs> so about the third family that I suggested this to, I, the room went quiet. <laughs> oh, oh, uh-oh. What, what have I missed? Right. What have I missed? So... 
I sort of finished up and we went on with the meeting. And about maybe two or three days later, I got a call from one of the sons of this family and his wife saying, you know, you made this suggestion about the grandparent and, and I said, you understand we're not going to do, our kids aren't participating. I said, really? Well, well, really? Well, tell me more, you know? Tell me more. They, they said, our relations with his parents are such that we think they're far too controlling, mm. far too uh, finger like this. And we are not subjecting our children anymore to that kind of behavior. Ow. Oh. Hughes got a flat nose. <laughs> Whoa, I got what? a flat nose. How, how did you respond? I said, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I did, I did say, do you agree? It's a good idea. They said, it's a great idea. In another family. Yeah, but just <laughs> not with these grandparents. Yeah, yeah. Now, I will say that some years later, I think they did try it because there were some things that happened that cleared up some of those problems or, or issues that the children had. So I'm always very careful with this kind of, with any practice, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. beginner's mind. You asked me about this once yeah. before. They come at no practice should be imposed. Any practice must start with the beginner's mind. Is this the right system? Is the system welcoming to this? And that, by the way, is one of the great difference between moving toward mastery, which we never achieve, and being an expert. Hmm. If you have an expert, if you're an expert, you really do have a hammer and everything looks like a nail. You really right. do. Right. If you're imagining mastery, you start always with a beginner's mind. Every, every issue, you start all over again. And then you don't run right into that flat nose, which is un quite uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I am curious just about this mastery and expertise issue, which I've heard you talk about before. And how do you find the balance? Because often people want an expert. The, the, the client wants an expert. Tell me what to do, how to fix this. And if you come in, so, so how do you balance coming in with a beginner's mind? And what does that actually look like when the, the, the family wants expertise or thinks they want expertise? Yep. Well, Great. <laughs> We're going to tell some real truths here. Great professionals like you and Keith in bringing this book to life understand that you're alchemists. You're under your alchemists. You're going to bring into conversation very good ideas, and you're doing it very carefully, prudently, saying, "Think about that." The problem of expertise is you get hung on your own ego, mm. just as I did in the first half of my life, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation. It's very hard when you're an expert to give up expertise for beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. it's, your I don't it's your comfort too, isn't it? Hugely. And Safety. by the way, how the world sees you. Yes, which reinforces it. Oh. And, the, and the commercial means of making a living. Also that. So I think that the, the beginner's mind, the, the master's path, doesn't say that you don't have expertise. It, but it does say that you have to find a way for that particular system, and every system is different, every family system is different, for that system to actually be able to acclimatate itself, the integration of that practice. If you don't think it can do that and you haven't considered it outside the room, then don't offer it. Mm, right. Right. Interesting. That's Interesting. that's that's not subtle. It's it's bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking too that this uh practice, back to the practice of uh grandparent, grandchild philanthropy, um, it's also one of those things that develops the skills of the grandchildren uh, as you're sort of in the, like in the family bank, you know, people have to make a presentation 
They have Correct. to deal with an outside organization, the philanthropy. They have to, um, exactly. you know, engage in, in communal discussion, all skills and muscles that need to be built and help develop the some of these capitals. 100 percent. And again, one doesn't have to say that. It just happens. Right. But right. but I'm glad you did say it for the yeah. audience, because, of course, uh, look, one of the great skills we need as an adult <clears throat> are the kind of skills that you just outlined. But where do you find a place to exercise? Them? Yeah. Yeah. And and more than that, since if I could just I think it's a wonderful question and point you've just made. Every family, Tom, at, that has an ambition to go a long distance, that starts with the why question. Why, why will each of us have a better life if we go together and try this? Is going to be, at the end of the day, the outcome is going to depend upon thousands of decisions. Social capital is just joint decision making. It's not something else. Well, if you can learn young with your grandparents there, with the cohort with whom you're going to be making those decisions, something simple like this, when everybody gets something, it's a good thing. Everybody's life is enhanced by that common experience. Guess what? You're learning how to make joint decisions with those mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a uh, meeting them at 40, you meet them at 15. And those skills stand you in really good stead at 40 when you're making really substantive decisions. Absolutely. So, yes, that's that's part of the alchemy. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to wait a little bit for this to put this practice into practice on my own life. I have we have our first um, grandchild who's a one year old daughter. Uh, and so I'll have to wait for a couple of years to, to start this practice. I, she is so blessed. How did she, <laughs> she, she chose wisely when Jeez. she chose what fa family to join. Very wise. This very year. wise. Very, very wise. wise. Exactly. So let me conclude our conversation with a couple of questions for you, general questions. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on them. The, the first one is what is the, um, what's the most common question people ask you? You meet somebody, you're chatting, they know a bit about what you do. What's the most, or one of the most common questions people ask you? I think the most common question is if they know something about me, are you still a lawyer? Hmm. And since I'm the sixth generation lawyer in my family, there's a little question about G2. We think he was a power, uh, and a, a, a um, oh, justice of the peace. We're not okay. absolutely sure. We we know what uh, we, we, we won't be auditing it, that no. for this call yeah. anyway. Um, and that's a very poignant question for me because I'm the sixth generation. My uh, uh, one of my daughter-in-laws and my son-in-laws are both judge, uh, lawyers. One's a judge. The woman who's marrying into our family will be the eighth generation. Uh, the law, the reason that that question is so important to me, Tom, is that the purpose of the law, as my father taught me, is to provide a safe, orderly society for people to flourish in. That's the purpose of the law, not controversy. So when people ask me, am I still a lawyer? It bothers me because it means that the profession has failed to convey to people who might seek the help of a lawyer what the lawyer's purpose is. It's not controversy. It's not advocacy. Hmm. It's part of that. And it's not uh, a technical practitioner. It is, are, is the service you're providing helping families grow within a safe, orderly society? So that's the question that I get very often, and I try not to be pontificating with my answer, but I say, yes, I still have my license, and uh, it matters to me. As long as, for me, I'm doing that larger, uh, meeting that larger responsibility. Right, right, okay. So my second question is, what is the most common question you ask people? Why? 
are you doing this? And they will give me any answers under the sun. And then I will almost always say to them, well, you know, if there's something really important, this is inherent in my question. In order for me to be of any help to you at all, I have to really know what your purpose is. Not your uh, what the simple answer, but no, what is your real purpose? That's that's the, the nature of the question I'm asking, and it takes a little while to find out. Is, because, is that hard for people to answer? Yes, because they're so unused to being asked. Mm -hmm. But what they're expecting is a how question. Purpose is only why. You can't you can't get out of it. You can't get to a how answer with a why question. Well, you can, but then you didn't answer the question. <laughs> right. you, 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 you missed the opportunity, to, not with Jay, but you missed the opportunity yourself to ask yourself a why question. Yeah. Why questions are way, way, way more important. And part of it's, Tom, because there's a funny story in Alice in Wonderland of Alice is walking in the woods and the Cheshire cat sitting on the branch, a big smile. And he asks Alice, where are you going? And she says, I don't know. And then he said, you're certain to get there. Well, my purpose in asking that question is purpose is, do you know where you're going? Right. Not for sure, but do you have some interior sense that you have a purpose? Now, because to be honest, at this stage of my life, I couldn't help anybody without a purpose. Hmm. I, I just couldn't. I wouldn't be of any use to them whatsoever. It's Unless not you can help them find a purpose? Ah, if that's their inclination. Right. Uh, the problem is that for lots of people, unfortunately, in the time that we're living in, purpose questions aren't asked. Hmm. Interesting. The how questions are easy in theory, but they're but if you don't know why, then how means nothing. Interesting. Okay, so my last question for you is, what is one concluding message or piece of advice that you would give to families who are thinking about these issues? Um, I'll, I'll say broadly, you know, it doesn't have to connect direct necessarily to the two, two chapters, but, you know, there's people who are listening to this who are thinking about issues that are important to their family. What's, what is your concluding thought or piece of advice that would be valuable to them? Um, because family requires two or more people. You can have a single person household. You cannot have a single person family. Two or more people on a, some common journey must then be making joint decisions. What's the ground on which you could make those decisions so you're, you might imagine a fifth generation hmm. doing well, as opposed to two or three generations and out? The core question of political philosophy of all time, all cultures is, can the two people, initial two people, give up freedom to gain freedom? It's an interior question. Will I trust you to help, to say, I will help you only knowing you might or might not help me, I can't know. Hmm. That's the core question of every marriage. That's the core question you bring a child to life because you are giving up freedom. The question is, do you perceive that selfish, but self in a very big sense as your great decision of your lifetime? Great families are founded on that single principle. Mm -hmm. Give up freedom, gain freedom. And for American audiences, uh, if you think back to the Mayflower compact joint decision-making system. The story I love about that, and I'll finish with this, is this. These people were religious fundamentalists. They were intending to go to Virginia, we think, but they ended up in Massachusetts late in the sailing season. So they had to stop. So they stopped in this place that none of them knew anything about, including the captain, Jones, and what to do. So two or three men got in a small boat, rowed into the beach, bound Plymouth and what have you, or at least think theoretically. The land looked good, there was water, and they came back to the ship. Now, these people had been on the ship for months and months. 
And you think the first thing they wanted to do would get on the land. No, they're much smarter than that. They said, what will it be like when we get there? Hmm. None of us knows. So they sat down together and they made a compact, a covenant, that they would help each other when they got there, hmm. giving up freedom to gain freedom. And only then did they go on the land. Oh, my goodness. That's the founding of a Beautiful. family. Beautiful. That's the founding, one of the founding stories of our American experience. Family matters. But you don't have a family that flourishes if there isn't inherent in it the willingness to give up freedom to gain freedom. That's the principle, Tom, that I wrote about in all my books, that the vision of a flourishing family is to enhance the individual journeys of happiness of each family member for the whole family flourishing. Hmm. That's the inherent premise of a family that has a long distance journey to make. Hmm. Beautiful. What a great conversation. I wish we could go on for longer, but our time is up and I thank really you. want to thank you, Jay, for taking the time. It's a lovely, lovely interaction, and uh, I, I'm not surprised, but I've learned uh, a lot from even just this conversation. So thank you so much. Namaste and blessings on the book and on the journey. Thank you so much.